speaker series. This uh, uh, speakership is sponsored by the uh, College of Arts and Sciences. Um, Environmental Studies hosts it with support from Geography and International Studies. Um, so it's my pleasure to welcome Greg Garman, the um, Director of Environmental Studies at Virginia Commonwealth University to talk to us today about the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, in addition, so Greg has many more responsibilities and roles with the university and with the state than I could possibly run off. Um, so it's a real privilege to have him come here and, and tell us about some of his work going on in the Bay. Um, a few of those, he serves on the, uh, you still serve in the Science and Technical Advisory Committee for the, the Stack Committee for the Chesapeake Bay, so that'll be directly related to some of the stuff we're talking about here. Written extensively about um, bluefish, blue catfish, sturgeon, other anadromous fish in the Bay over a long period of time, dating back 400 years. Well, you've written for a long period of time, wow, and the studies have, <laughs> not, not yet. <laughs> Sometimes it does feel like it. Huh? Um, and organizes the INSTAR program um, to look at uh, uh, stream fish assemblages in Virginia, so very active in the state as well. So two things I wanted to point out um, before I turn it over to Greg <laughs> is one, uh, as the director of the environmental studies program at VCU, he um, helped forge a new relationship with the University of Richmond to participate in their accelerated master's program. So um, you may have heard of this uh, relationship we have with Duke, where um, in your fourth year uh, of studies, you can take graduate program, you can actually go down to Duke and take um, um, some, uh, to finish your degree down there, and then graduate with a bachelor's from here and a master's from Duke. We have a similar arrangement with VCU, where in your fourth year, you could begin taking graduate level courses in environmental studies and have those courses count both towards your degree, your bachelor's degree here, and a master's degree. So that's a pretty exciting development. Um, and also as the research director of VCU's um, Rice Center down on the James River, um, he oversees a world-class research program um, within stones throw, not quite stones, so if you've really got a really strong arm, maybe Sam's son can throw it um, down to um, the Rice Center from here, but oversees a world-class class research program um, on big rivers, wetland, upland ecosystems, um, so those of you who may be thinking about summer research opportunities, um, there's uh, a great opportunity, there's great opportunities um, locally uh, within the Richmond area. Um, I'm sure he'd be happy to talk about either or both of those opportunities with you after um, his talk this evening. So Greg, I'll turn it over to you and thanks again for coming. Thanks, Todd. And uh, <laughs> thank you for the invitation. It's good to be here. Thank you for uh, for coming. It's good to see some, some old friends that I don't get to see too often. Uh, it's kind of unfortunate. Uh, we're separated by what? seven or eight miles and uh, I just don't get over here uh, terribly often so uh, it's good to see everybody um, just a real quick uh, preamble of what to expect um, by training I'm a fish guy I'm a fisheries ecologist um, working both sort of applied questions as well as some basic questions I've worked in marine systems estuarine systems freshwater systems um, so uh, I'll just apologize up front. This is going to be a very fishy talk. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also a frustrated historian, and uh, I love trying to put these two things together. So um, hopefully that that will work. Um, we're going to look over a period of about about 400 years. Um, a lot of the work that that I've done myself has been on the James River, Rappahannock, Potomac, more Virginia rivers, but I'm going to try to generalize it to Chesapeake Bay, so that's sort of the geographic context. Temporal context is that 400 year uh, period. And my, the final comment is uh, not really knowing what the, the mix of majors or backgrounds is. Um, this is probably a little science oriented um, so if there's a term that I don't explain or something that I've kind of lost you um, I'm very comfortable with you just sort of jumping in and saying 
hey, before you move on, what do you mean by that? So we can be very, uh, very informal if, if that's okay with you. And uh, I used to lecture to 300 seat lectures at VCU for introductory zoology. So I'm pretty loud and obnoxious, but if you can't hear me all the way in the back, please let me know. Uh, that presumes what I have to say is worth hearing, but uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm happy to try to speak up. So, 400 years of uh, fish and fisheries in Chesapeake Bay. So let, let's do a little uh, uh, what if sort of exercise here. And I don't know what y'all's background is in terms of if you're from this area um, or you're from some very different place. I don't know what your experience is with Chesapeake Bay, but uh, you've been here long enough that you certainly know something about it. So if you asked yourself, gee, I wonder what the Chesapeake Bay used to look like, certainly before European colonization, we'd probably all come up with some different ideas. But this is sort of my view of what the Chesapeake Bay might have been like before 1607. <laughs> What's the magic of 1607? Jamestown, founding of Jamestown. So we're going to use that as sort of the point at which uh, um, at least European humans were permanent here and started to have some sort of uh, effect. So a lot of this is pretty pretty obvious I think maybe some a little less so so everybody's probably heard about the uh, the old guy and I probably count as that too who every year wades into somewhere up in Maryland and Chesapeake Bay and, and he, you know how far can he go out and still see his sneakers and that's a very rough uh, very subjective index of water clarity in Chesapeake Bay and of course Lately, he can't walk out quite so far. So it's sort of like uh, one of those Secchi discs that he does to a lot of fanfare every year. So historically, and every time I use that, just think that 1607 number. Historically, water clarity would have been really kind of amazing in Chesapeake Bay. And that was because of at least two things. One is that the combined population of Virginia oysters in Chesapeake Bay historically turned over the entire volume of Chesapeake Bay in a couple of days. You just you can't even imagine what that must have been like. So of course the oysters are filter feeders, so they're pulling algae out of the water and that's maintaining very good water quality. Plus, as we'll see, these systems back then in Chesapeake Bay, the tidal tributaries, were just not very productive. There weren't a lot of nutrients. Primary production was not very high, as well as secondary production going all the way up the food chain. So there just wasn't all that much in the water column. And what plankton was there was constantly being pulled out of the water column. So you could see to the bottom in 20 or 30 feet of water. Just, if you spend any time on Chesapeake Bay now, it's hard to imagine. So if you think, well, what would be the uh, upshot of that? If there's a lot of clarity to the water, sunlight can penetrate to great depths, and so you're going to have a lot of aquatic macrophytes. So aquatic plants, um, estuarine plants, are, are, would have been very, very common whether it's Spartina down in the salt marshes or freshwater plants further upstream. So a lot of vegetation. And for fish that matters. Not because fish eat plants, because in the temperate world, it's too cold too much of the year. Fish can't ingest enough plant material to make a living at that. So fish don't, aren't herbivorous typically in temperate regions but its structure, and most fish are very structure oriented, and especially for early life history stages, structure really matters. So lots of aquatic vegetation, more or less fish depending on season. 
This is going to be a theme throughout this talk. Right now, if I go out to the uh, Lower James River or Lower Potomac River, the number of fish, the <coughs> fish biomass out there is more or less constant. Doesn't matter if it's January or July, it's going to be about the same standing stock of fish biomass. But historically, when fish that migrate into Chesapeake Bay for a period and then leave again, when those migratory species were numerically dominant, we'd get a real peak in biomass and abundance at certain times of the year and then a real drop at other times. So there were these great seasonal movements and shifts. So sometimes there were more fish than today, sometimes less. Almost all of the fish that were in Chesapeake Bay at the time were not residents. They were migratory species, and we're going to get into that in a little bit. So again, they spent some of their time in Chesapeake Bay and the rivers, and the rest of it they spent out in the North Atlantic someplace. Okay. So have this notion of, of terrific movements of organisms between the bay and the marine system. Of course, all the species were native at that point. And of course, very limited human effects. Um, not that the Native Americans didn't have some effect on landscapes, but especially in terms of the waters in Chesapeake Bay. And yeah, they had fisheries, but um, the harvest of those fisheries was so minimal that they just weren't having an effect on these fish. So a very different system then compared to today. Those changes over 400 years didn't happen all at once, obviously. And in fact, this is just my notion of how these events and effects played themselves out over about 400 years. But there was sort of a sequence of these changes to the ecosystem of Chesapeake Bay as a result of human activities. And so if you bear with me, what I'm going to do for the rest of this talk is just walk through this list, sort of this chronology of human effects on Chesapeake Bay and the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So starting in about uh, before the mid-1700s, that's a period of very uh, limited natural effects, and we'll start there. But my basic thesis, um, and it probably sounds grander than it really is, is that this 400 year period that we're talking about, roughly 1607 to today, the Chesapeake Bay ecosystem has changed more in that 400 years than it had in the previous 12,000 plus or minus years of the whole Holocene epoch. There's certainly uh, post-glaciation, there were still changes going on, uh, some return to an equilibrium state, but those were very slow changes, probably not terribly dramatic. And in this tiny little 400-year window, I'm arguing, we've done more to change Chesapeake Bay than natural changes affected for this whole 12,000-year period leading up to today. So. We're going to start in that very early period. The Europeans have just hit the beach. Uh, there haven't really been a whole lot of uh, human activities that could have been measured as effects, probably. And I warned you, I'm interested in, in, in this thing from a fish perspective. So um, it's fun for me to go and look at what uh, John Smith said about the fish that they encountered. So this is, a, I think, potentially important. So here's a little quote from John Smith, 1606. Of course, these folks cared a great deal about fish because they were hungry a lot of the time and they needed protein. And I don't think it's, uh, you know, it goes on, it starts with sturgeon, and we'll come back to that, and talks about herrings and trouts. They were trout. Uh, porpoises raised mullets, some of those we kind of relate to today. And then uh, they sort of borrowed some terms from the old world because they saw a fish that it kind of looks like 
that old wives fish, but maybe not. Uh, might have been taxonomically related place we know what that is, crabs, oysters. Then they get into things that even I haven't been able to figure out what they were talking about. But for them, this is a this is a shopping list. This is a grocery list for these folks who didn't know how to grow crops very well here, but they certainly knew how to catch fish. These were uh, folks that spent a lot of time on the water. They understood how to do that. Uh, and I don't think it's a coincidence that sturgeon is at the top of that grocery list. And why might that be? Because at the time, sturgeon in England were considered a royal fish, which meant only the king or his representatives were allowed to possess sturgeon. If a commoner had a sturgeon off with his head or whatever they did back then, you weren't allowed to have it. And here all of a sudden they get to the other side of the Atlantic and they're knee deep in this resource that they aren't even allowed to possess in the old country. They didn't care about sturgeon for caviar. That's a recent thing. Um, most folks that cared about sturgeon historically didn't care about the eggs. There is nothing like smoked sturgeon. It is one of the most I'll deny that I've ever actually had it. It was before the listing endangered thing, whatever. Uh, but it, it's a, here's this huge fish that moves into shallow water. It doesn't swim very fast. It's not particularly scary to try to catch or handle. And they're enormous. So these great big packets of protein that in the old country were off limits, couldn't be touched. And so uh, there's been a whole lot of interest at Jamestown, for example, in sturgeon. Um, the archaeologists there refer to sturgeon as the fish that saved Jamestown. They have that in some of their literature. Uh, they'll even joke that if it wasn't for Atlantic sturgeon, we'd all be speaking Spanish right now because Jamestown would have failed. Uh, we even had the privilege of uh, they went into a, a well that was dated 1610 and pulled a bunch of sturgeon parts out. And we were able to look at something called a pectoral spine and make sections of it and figure out how old the sturgeon were that were caught back then and even how fast they grew. Uh, it turns out they grew much more slowly back then than they did now, than they do now. Um, and that might be climate issues or just it was a stunted population because nobody had caught them, so there was, wasn't enough to eat. So that's sort of a, a baseline. Fish everywhere, the best kinds to eat, um, and, and a very natural system. That is not a human-dominated system at all. So within about 50 years or so, as folks started to set up um, economic systems in Virginia. They needed power. The only source of power back then was water power. So they started to build dams everywhere. We're not talking about great high dams. We're talking about these little low head affairs on every stream, every river that they could find for mill power. So, um, here close to home, this is uh, Williams Dam, the Z Dam on the James. This is Bosher's Dam. Um, and what makes this side of North America different from the Pacific side is the dominant fishes out there, the Pacific salmon, you've all seen the videos of, you know, unless the dam is like 20 feet tall, the salmon can leap and jump over the dam clear it, get to the other side, and continue swimming upstream to spawn. The dominant migratory fishes on this side of the continent, six inches, that's it, I'm done, I'm turning around and going home. The shads and the herrings and the striped bass and the sturgeon on this side of the country, they don't jump, they don't even attempt it. So these really small mill dams thousands and thousands of them across the landscape 
had a huge effect on breaking the ecological connectedness between the marine systems and the freshwater systems. A huge ecological effect. So what are we talking about? So here's a term I'll throw out. I've used migratory fishes till now. Now I'm going to use the term anadromous. And so that's just a form of uh, migratory behavior. So for example, American shad or river herring, they spend most of their life as adults out in the Atlantic somewhere eating marine derived food, growing big, and then they come into fresh water to spawn. They do their thing, turn around, and blow back out. At least most of them do. You probably know that Pacific Salmonids on the other side of the country, you've seen the bumper stickers spawn and die. So their life history means after they reproduce once, they die typically in fresh water on the spawning grounds. The migratory or anadromous species here can do that route two or three times. So we say that they are partially iteroparous in terms of their life history strategy. So after maybe two or three spawning events, they still do die, but they can come back a couple of times. The species that I'm talking about, of course, striped bass, that's American shad. There's another smaller congener called a hickory shad. These are blueback herring. There's another slightly larger congener called an alewife. That's the uh, Atlantic sturgeon. And that's the sea lamprey, which, yeah, on the Great Lakes, it's a bad thing. But on the Atlantic slope, it's a native anadromous fish. It belongs here. So we don't uh, consider it evil. In addition to these truly migratory species, there were uh, white perch, yellow perch, a whole other group of semi-migratory species. The point I'm trying to make is, historically, it's these species that were numerically dominant, hugely dominant, literally billions of individuals. They all grew in the marine system, and then they come into fresh water and have some pretty significant <coughs> ecological consequences. What do I mean by that? So here's that slide. These are adult blueback herring. Uh, this is a tidal freshwater stream in Maryland. Uh, you can see that little low head dam there, which is still intact. So these fish are going to swim up to the dam. If conditions are right, they'll spawn. Whether the habitat is great or not, they'll probably go ahead and spawn, and then a bunch of them will turn around and swim back out, and the rest will die. But ecologically, all of these fish are little packages of marine-derived carbon. And of course, carbon is energy. So if a, a predator grabs one of these things in a freshwater system, and predators receiving a marine subsidy of energy. All these fish are also excreting ammonia nitrogen, a nutrient. But that also is a marine derived nutrient. So basically, the point here is, both from the fish while they're alive as well as, well as their carcasses after they die in these freshwater streams, every spring, there was this enormous, and I'm talking here, hundreds of millions of pounds of marine-derived carbon and a lot of nutrients that would hit these freshwater rivers early in the spring, jumpstart the productivity of these systems, and then leave a lot of that biomass behind for the system, by system I mean creek or stream or river, to run off of for the rest of the year. So those thousands and thousands of little tiny dams cut that connection between freshwater and marine systems. And we think that had an enormous ecological effect and impact. So what are we trying to do about that? Well, uh, 
Bless their heart, the Corps of Engineers, after spending 50 years trying to put a dam everywhere, is now going to spend the next 50 years, I hope, tearing all the dams down. So uh, this was Embry Dam on the Rappahannock. And after uh, the Navy SEALs uh, had a loose wire or something, the first attempt didn't work. Imagine that. And some poor guy had, gee, it didn't go off. Um, and all these dignitaries were watching, and somebody had to go, and where's the loose wire? I'm sure it was not quite like that. But eventually the charge went off. Embry Dam blew up. And what you're left with now, there's the old dam, and what you're left with is a reestablished connection. Of course, the water always went downstream, but it's material, i.e. fish, that would move upstream. And we've reestablished that two-way connection. Now, before we get too excited, um, engineers love to call this ecosystem restoration. Why? Well, we blew a piece of the dam out and you see there's this place now it's reconnected it's the Kevin Costner if you build it they'll come notion mm -hmm. from an ecological standpoint we aren't sure if these are really restored systems um, in fact just this past year folks in my lab were working a little bit upstream from here trying to document the return of these migratory fishes and they're slowly coming back. But um, we should be really careful in an ecological context using the term restoration. We talk about stream restoration and ecosystem restoration. Restoration means you took something that had been changed and you return it to its original state. We aren't that good. We can't do that as ecologists. So this was a swell thing to do, but it, it, it's not as easy as just blowing up a dam. It might take 50 or 60 or 100 years before American Shad are once again moving up through there to spawn. But we should still do it. All right. So these dams haven't gone away. They didn't start going away until sort of the uh, late 1800s um, when steam power came on board and electricity. We didn't need the mills. Um, but most of those dams are still here in the mid-1800s when we started to kick the system in a different way with the introduction of non-native fishes. So if you've had a history class, you might have run into this phrase the Columbian Exchange. And it's the notion that from the time Columbus uh, sort of put his flag in uh, 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 saw something on TV the other day. The Bahamas, I think, was first, and then maybe El Salvador or someplace like that. From the first time um, that Europeans really became established, they brought with them critters that were uh, important to them. So honeybees and uh, horses and uh, uh, feral hogs and, you know, these large critters or in the case of honeybees, smaller ones. We've heard about a lot of that. Um, if you're interested in that, this fellow Charles Mann wrote this really cool book, uh, 1491, that tries to capture what this place was like just before European contact. Okay, so I warned you, I'm going to be talking about fish. So the piece of the Columbian exchange that I particularly care about in terms of a Chesapeake Bay context are all of these non-indigenous, that means not native, some of them exotic, an exotic introduction is one that came from a different continent. So grass carp from Asia, common carp from Asia, those would be considered exotics, northern snakehead from Asia. But it's not just the exotics. It's critters like um, smallmouth bass. It's not native to Virginia. 
at least the Atlantic Slope rivers, was introduced from the Mississippi Basin. Uh, this is a walleye. Yeah, there are a few walleye in the James River. Wouldn't probably expect that. Again, Upper Mississippi Basin, uh, green sunfish from the Mississippi. And then these two beauties. Uh, this is a blue catfish and a flathead catfish, uh, also both from the Lower Mississippi Basin. So uh, blue catfish is a critter that I've learned to uh, not have a lot of affection for. Uh, we're going to talk about it a little bit. But just sort of as an example, there are a lot of other non-native species that have been introduced, established, and have now become invasive within Chesapeake Bay. So uh, you can, just for context, here's the James River, York, Rappahannock, you can see where we are. So uh, Richmond's right about there. And there were a handful of introductions of blue catfish back in the 1970s, and they were introduced on purpose to provide recreational fishing experiences. So uh, they expanded relatively slowly. Um, now they get into 1996, 2002. They show up in the Potomac and a few other places, uh, Pamunkey and Mattapani. By uh, 2008, we started to see them show up in the Patuxent and the Nanticoke in Maryland. Uh, we've tried to do some GIS modeling to understand what the dispersal mechanisms are. Uh, we think that uh, flushing events, that is freshwater spates, you get a hurricane, a big slug of fresh water goes downstream and allows this generally freshwater critter to go out into the bay, move upstream, and move into a different river system. Uh, it also turns out that all the literature, all the biologists was wrong. They said this thing had a relatively narrow salinity tolerance. Um, I'll show you a picture in a minute that uh, gives the lie to that. We're also more and more convinced of the importance of the Bubba effect. I'm not meaning any disrespect here, but when Bubba likes to catch these 70, 80, 90 pound blue catfish, he doesn't want to have to drive to the Rappahannock River anymore. He wants to be able to do that in his own backyard. So somehow a few end up in the cooler, end up in his favorite fishing hole, and uh, of course it's all illegal, but there's no enforcement of any of these rules. So what about the blue catfish today? I'll spend a little time on this screen. This map shows the, uh, as current as we have data, the current distribution of this one invasive species, this blue catfish in Chesapeake Bay. It's in every Virginia river, in a whole bunch of the Maryland rivers. It's established well in the upper Chesapeake Bay. And within the last two or three years, watermen have started to catch blue catfish in pound nets off of Tangier Island and the Virginia Eastern Shore. So um, we think that this is you know, probably get down to about this level in Chesapeake Bay based on we now understand the salinity tolerance, at least for short periods, up around 20 parts per thousand. Still freshwater fish, but highly adaptable and very much of, an, of a habitat generalist. Um, we, I was reluctant to do this, but we were asked to try to estimate, so how many blue catfish are there in Chesapeake Bay? Uh, the answer is plus or minus a big confidence interval, about 100 million of these fish. And remember, these are novel predators. If they get up to 100 pounds or so, anything over three pounds, these fish can be predators. Um, so we're starting to ask the question, what is the effect, potentially, of 100 million introduced non-native predators in the Chesapeake Bay watershed? And as I said, we're starting to move down into the Bay problem. Um, just to give you a sense of the abundance and the density, uh, this is one hole 
in the James River um, at the Turkey Island Cut, it's, in terms of surface area, it's a space about as big as this room. And this is a, uh, you know, it's a really, really expensive fish finder that, that we moved through there. And it has the ability with the software to count every target that reflects back the sonar and then roughly estimate the size of what that target is. You can't say those are blue catfish, but it did tell us, this is just one data set, in that one area the size of this room, there were over 5,000 targets that were the size of blue catfish, and then we did some ground truthing, and indeed that's all that was in this, this hole. My point is, really enormous densities and abundances, but only a single species. It's kind of like cornfields are great, they're really productive, but if you don't want corn anymore, um, you're, you're kind of stuck because nothing else uh, seems to thrive. Uh, so we've uh, done a fair bit of research, not just my own lab, but other folks in Chesapeake Bay trying to understand the impacts of these invasive species. Um, we're, we have pretty good evidence through stable isotope work and some other things that this introduced predator species is probably having a negative effect on, remember that uh, Embry Dam and they blew it up and they made a big breach in Embry Dam and reestablished the connectedness? Well, of course, guess what else can swim up through that breach now? Oh yeah, these introduced predatory catfishes. So uh, we're not seeing a lot of response in terms of uh, recovery of these native migratory species and we think a part of that might be this gauntlet of predators that they have to run. Um, we haven't seen a complete extirpation of a species yet but there are a couple of native catfishes that are so rare now that when one of us catches one in our surveys, we'll call you know, the other biologists and say, hey, we've got a white catfish, how about that? Uh, I'll talk a little bit about contaminants in fish-eating birds and why we're uh, concerned about that. Carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus cycling, where's that coming from? Um, well, if you take those 100 million blue catfish that just they don't migrate, they don't move anywhere, they just sit in Chesapeake Bay, and you multiply it by the average size, that's about 300 million pounds of fish. 50% of that fish biomass is carbon, about 10% of that fish biomass is nitrogen, and about 2% is phosphorus. So we're, we're all concerned about excess nutrients and the Bay TMDL and eutrophication, and the question I'm starting to ask is, what effect is that enormous pool of, uh, of these nutrients, um, what effect might that have on trying to limit uh, excess nutrients in, bay, in the bay? And then we've also started to see uh, the potential for these invasive species to affect the few remaining relatively healthy commercial fisheries in Chesapeake Bay. So we got some, got some funding from NOAA over the past couple of years. Um, I know these pictures aren't pretty. Uh, fisheries work is often not. So we looked at gut contents for a lot of these large predators, both uh, flathead catfish and blue catfish. And we found blue crabs in a lot of the guts. That's an adult blueback herring. These are white perch. So these are largely native species that are ecologically and economically really important. Uh, and then without going into a whole lot of detail, in this study we picked a couple of specific locations and estimated total losses due to predation of a couple of high value target species. And if you're interested, off off the grid, I can talk to you about the methods for all of that. So Burwell Bay and Lower Chesapeake Bay, or Lower James River rather, 
Um, just in two months, 2012, we estimated that collectively blue catfish predators in that one part of the river consumed about a million juvenile Atlantic menhaden, about half a million small blue crabs, uh, soft shell clams, um, over two million flathead catfish predators, another one of these large uh, introduced uh, species. Um, this is in just one month in one little location of the James River, again, not much bigger than this room. Um, perhaps as many as 10,000 blueback herring that are being considered for uh, federal protection and listing. So we think there's a huge potential for impacting commercial fisheries and the fisheries in Chesapeake Bay don't need another, uh, another problem. So what's the next thing we did? By the late 1800s, there's strong evidence that we started to harvest fisheries in Chesapeake Bay in a manner that was non-sustainable. So here's what happened there. Uh, there have always been fisheries in Chesapeake Bay, but um, up until, oh, about 1900 or so, all of those fisheries were solely rely, relied solely on human power. Okay. Somebody to haul a beach seine, somebody to work a purse seine. This was hard work. Um, and that reliance on human power greatly reduced the efficiency of the fishery. Right around 1880, when you started to see a lot of steam power being used, what we saw was a terrific uptick in the total effort that could be applied to harvest of one or more fisheries. So our efficiency at harvesting these fish went way up. And efficiency is a good thing. It's a, you know, we all like efficiency. But if you don't couple efficiency with regulation or management, what you have is within about 20 years, non-sustainable harvests of, and I'll give you the, the rundown in the next slide, of most of the major finfish and shellfish in Chesapeake Bay, um, the stocks began to tank. And remember, these fisheries were targeting almost exclusively these migratory species. There's still, you know, back in 1880, there wasn't much in the way of non-native species yet. That has occurred much more recently. So uh, these migratory species already were depressed due to all the dams, and now non-sustainable harvest practices got rid of the rest, almost the rest. So uh, don't try to figure the slide out. Just look at the solid line. This is landings of American Shad in Virginia, landings of Atlantic Menhaden in Chesapeake Bay, and you could pick most other finfish and shellfish stocks and you would see the same thing over a period of about 20, 30 years, dramatic declines. Um, why do we care about that change? Um, because these fisheries put a lot of folks to work and generated a tremendous economic value for Virginia, Maryland, and other places within Chesapeake Bay. So we have lost literally billions of dollars um, based on the types of changes that we have allowed to happen in Chesapeake Bay. So oyster, American shad, Atlantic sturgeon, these river herrings, blue crabs, menhaden, striped bass, all of these fisheries are either on life support or are in pretty serious uh, poor shape. There were ecological consequences to this decline in fisheries as well. Um, again, rather than try to figure this out, maybe just trust me as I explain it to you. So one of my graduate students, Kathy Vibret, got permission to go to the Smithsonian and pull a feather off of every bald eagle and osprey in their collection that had been collected from Chesapeake Bay. 
And uh, we worked with a, another gentleman at UVA, Steve Macko, to do stable isotope analysis. Bottom line is what we were able to do is to evaluate how important marine carbon was to ospreys and eagles historically compared to now. And it was kind of gratifying to see that um, that date is 1840. We had data going back that far. And of course, it's, it's an ecological data set, so the regression is kind of messy, but there is a statistically significant trend that uh, eagles and ospreys used to depend heavily on marine carbon and currently much less so. And it all goes back to the change from these migratory species to non-migratory and in many cases non-native species. So ecological effects as well. Um, starting around the early 1900s, 1920, um, we had uh, machinery that could go in and, and change in a major way uh, a river channel or the hydrology of a system. So that became sort of the next uh, significant change in these rivers at Chesapeake Bay. So of course, uh, going back to 1860, the only vessels in these rivers and in the bay were relatively small, shallow draft, a wind or, or, or steam powered vessels. And now if you go out to the James River in particular, uh, you can see proper ocean going cargo ships. In fact, you have to be kind of careful. Uh, you're taking your life in your hands if you spend too much time and linger in the maintained channel, not just in the James, but the Potomac and a lot of other parts of Chesapeake Bay uh, the Corps has to maintain these uh, channels for these very large deep draft ships. This dredging and hydro modification has completely changed the geomorphology of a lot of these rivers, tidal dynamics, sediment transport, water residence times. It's been a huge effect in terms of hydro modification. Um, the other problem we found is these large vessels uh, that are there because of the hydro modification um, have caused, uh, we think, probably nearly a hundred mortalities of Atlantic sturgeon just in the James. So here's the James River. Richmond's way up here somewhere. And it historically wound, and there were lots of oxbows, and the river moved relatively slowly as it meandered. And in the 20s, the Corps just went in and made these cut-throughs so that the ships could get up to Richmond and back in a little shorter time. When these container ships get in that very narrow cut-through, uh, there isn't enough water for both the sturgeon and the ship. And uh, so unfortunately, the sturgeon uh, loses that, uh, that competition. And uh, we think this is probably going to be a, a major impediment to the recovery of this federally endangered species, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, particularly around the mid-20th century, um, and if we talk about the James River, a town called Hopewell uh, during the Second World War built itself as the chemical capital of the world. Um, Nothing's wrong with chemicals, you just have to keep them out of the river. Um, and so the James and all of the uh, coastal rivers in Chesapeake Bay were heavily contaminated by toxic compounds. Um, when I was a college student, and this will give you an idea of how old I am, uh, there was a, an enormous uh, deal over a chemical called ketone in the James River that was dumped um, illegally and is still down in the sediments. Uh, but, but the good news, and there is some good news here, because of the Clean Water Act and enforcement, we don't worry so much about contaminants out of a pipe that are coming into the James or the Rappahannock or Potomac or 
the Tuxen or any of these Chesapeake Bay rivers. Um, there's a, a lot of enforcement now. Um, current contaminant loading of Chesapeake Bay is, is uh, much lower than it used to be, but you can't get away from the stuff that was dumped in a long time ago. So these contaminants, of course, are generally synthetic, long-lived compounds. They don't go away. And think about it. An American shad, one of these migratory fish, it comes into the James River, hangs out for a month, turns around, runs back out. Very limited opportunity to acquire a body burden of things like PCBs or tributyl tin or, or DD, <coughs> DDP. But we've gotten rid of most of those migratory species. All the biomass out there are resident fish that can sit there year in and year out. Blue catfish live for 30, 40 years and can accumulate enormous body burdens with some of these contaminants. Eagles and osprey, they don't have the migratory fish to eat anymore, so guess what they eat? Blue catfish. Over 50% of their diet in these coastal rivers is blue catfish. There's one right there, and those are two bald eagle chicks. Um, this is work we did with, with Brian Watts and Catherine Markham from uh, William and Mary. And we're, we're really concerned with these legacy PCBs that are now in fish like blue catfish and, and some other non-native fishes that are forming the lion's share of the diet of eagles and ospreys. So there was the whole Rachel Carson Silent Spring thing. A lot of that had to do with uh, contaminants. Um, this might be a revisitation of that. We aren't really sure. This is really expensive work to do, uh, to do the toxicological uh, body burden work. Um, we haven't started to see ospreys die yet, so uh, that's probably what it will take. Um, the final insult, if you will, to Chesapeake Bay right up until the present time are these two words, eutrophication and sedimentation. Um, sedimentation, well, that's kind of self-evident. Eutrophication, if you're not familiar with that term, is just excess nutrients. Uh, a nutrient diet that is beyond the capability of the system to assimilate it. And remember, historically, Chesapeake Bay was pretty nutrient poor. There weren't a lot of nutrients in the system except those marine nutrients that were brought in every spring by the fish. There's been an enormous amount of work done trying to understand uh, where these excess nutrients, sediment, are coming from. Um, you probably all heard of the Chesapeake Bay TMDL, Total Maximum Daily Load Modeling, um, that will tell the city of Richmond, for example, uh, you need to spend $40 million to reduce the amount of nitrogen or phosphorus that you're putting into Chesapeake Bay. Um, this model right now makes the assumption that the vast majority of nutrients and sediment entering Chesapeake Bay is coming from agricultural sources. Uh, surely some of it is. Uh, the model ignores urban sources and uh, ignores some other uh, maybe more novel sources. One really cool recent study that's been done um, is getting awful lot of attention. Uh, it's being done by um, Bob Walter and uh, Dorothy Merritts up at Franklin and Marshall College. Um, again, this is sort of a historical ecology thing. So everybody has just assumed that these enormous sediment loads coming into Chesapeake Bay are a uh, sediment of modern origin. It's erosion that happened last year or the year before. Um, Walter and Merritt's uh, started to look at, this is up in Lancaster County and York and Chester County, Pennsylvania, at mill dams, which takes us all the way back to one of the first slides when I talked about all of these low head dams that are built for water power. They started to look at old maps and old records, and it turned out there was just a staggering, were staggering numbers of these dams built 
Um, by one estimate in the Mid-Atlantic, uh, by 1840, there were 65,000 of these dams. And basically, there were, on some of these creeks, there wasn't a mile of free-flowing stream anymore. It was a stair step of dam pool, dam pool, dam pool. Of course, what did dams and pooled water do? They act as a sediment trap. So we started looking at all these streams in Lancaster County that had these really high banks, deeply incised channels, and said, where did all that come from? This doesn't look like natural stream morphology. Uh, quick and dirty of it is, uh, they've concluded that most of this sediment that is sloughing off and ending up in Chesapeake Bay right now is legacy sediment. This is sediment that was, you know, when the Mid-Atlantic was clear cut the first time, all that erosion, when the Mid-Atlantic was clear cut the second time, and then you had that thing called the Civil War that resulted in a great deal of deforestation and erosion. All of that sediment ended up behind these 65,000 mill dams. Sometime in the 50s, these dams started to break down of their own accord, um, causing the, the stream to cut down through all of this accumulated sediment. And uh, their numbers show that probably 70% of the accumulated sediment coming into Chesapeake Bay isn't modern, but is coming from these legacy sources. Really a, a really interesting study that's completely blowing the bay model um, out of the water, which some people who've paid millions of dollars for it aren't really happy about. Um, I think this is the second to last slide. What about um, ex, um, excess nutrients and eutrophication? Um, you know, fish don't really care about nutrients unless they're really, really at a low concentration or at a really, really high concentration. Anything in between, they're kind of indifferent to it. But what we've discovered recently is, because of eutrophication, we're starting to get harmful algal blooms in parts of the bay that would have never experienced these harmful algal blooms. And some of these algae are producing, producing toxins that, at least in the laboratory, we can demonstrate have a significant physiological effect on fish, and shellfish. Um, and one we're just starting to understand a little bit is a blue-green algae called microcystis. It produces a toxin called microcystin. And we've known about it forever, but it's always been associated with um, impoundments and farm ponds and stagnant standing water. And we're now starting to see um, very significant microcystis blooms in the James and Potomac Rivers. And we're trying to figure out what's going on there. Um, okay, this is the last slide. I've been really negative, Debbie Downer, gloom and doom, uh, Chicken Little, the sky's falling, all of that. And unfortunately, the, the history of the past 400 years is very much a, uh, a story of how we haven't taken good care of Chesapeake Bay and the resources that uh, could jumpstart the economy of Virginia and Maryland overnight if we had access to those resources again. Um, I'm reluctant to look ahead and try to predict what's going on. I think down the road, uh, water quality will become much less of a problem. We kind of will have a handle on that. It'll be water quantity, uh, and it's the old thing that one day water will be worth more than, than oil. And we're starting to see some of those pressures now, uh, even in Chesapeake Bay. But I'm going to leave you on a, with a happy little story, at least I hope it'll have a happy ending, and go back to one of my favorite critters, which is the Atlantic sturgeon that uh, we've been very privileged to be able to work on. So, real quick story, then I'll shut up and let you guys go. Sometimes commercial watermen really do know what they're talking about. So, only 15 years ago, 
all of the biologists, fish biologists in Chesapeake Bay said, Atlantic sturgeon, they're gone. They're extirpated, they aren't in Chesapeake Bay, we're never gonna see them again. And the watermen were like, really? We get them all the time. Turned out, we just, we being the biologists, just didn't know the how, when, and where to catch them. And the watermen were kind enough to show us how to do that. And so we started to find a few sturgeon in one location, and that was the James River. Just within the past couple of years, and of course, uh, 2012, Atlantic sturgeon were federally listed as endangered, um, and all of a sudden, wheels started to turn, recovery plan, um, it becomes a great big deal for this, this area. But what we're finding is, now that we know where to look, and how to look, we're finding sturgeon in places we never expected to find them. And in those places where we knew sturgeon were, we're finding way more of them than we thought. <coughs> so when Atlantic sturgeon was listed for the James River, the official number from NOAA was 300 individuals. Well, we now know there are at least an order of magnitude more than that probably three to 5,000 individuals just in the James River. We thought they were gone from Maryland waters. Last year, biologists found spawning sturgeon in the Marshy Oak River of Maryland. We're starting to find them in the Rappahannock and the York system. And the reason that should make us feel hopeful is sturgeon are a great canary in the mine shaft sort of critter, a sentinel species. They are very intolerant of low dissolved oxygen, very intolerant of sedimentation. They need relatively good habitat, good water quality to do well. Now, they still aren't in places where they used to be, and we're nowhere near declaring the species recovered, not anything like it. But I've been encouraged, and other people have been encouraged, that if we're starting to see the return on their own accord, not because we've done anything in terms of management, if sturgeon are starting to show up higher abundance in some places we've never seen them, at least in the last hundred years, that means that maybe we're doing something right in terms of water quality and habitat protection in Chesapeake Bay waters. And uh, hopefully we'll see the not just sturgeon come back, but all of these other migratory species. And uh, there'll be some miracle, the catfish will go away, and uh, we'll get back to a bay similar to the one that uh, we had 400 years ago, or at least maybe close to it. Anyway, uh, thank you for your attention. I appreciate it, and uh, that's all I have. I know some folks may have to run to catch their other obligations and so forth, but I um, encourage folks to come up and, and talk with Greg, ask him questions um, about um, his talk, uh, the uh, programs going on at, at VCU, and uh, let's give him one more round of applause back. Uh,